Okay, so bots. You may have seen reference to bots when we were working with the cookie cutter because one of the things that the cookie cutter does include by default, although I'm not sure why it does, is uh, an implementation of a bot. And we've been a little nervous when describing exactly what an agent and a participant is. And we've been shying away from saying it's a person because it's not always a person. It's something that is interacting like a person, but bots are a built-in part of Dallinger that allow you to say, actually, I don't want a person to do this. I want another bit of software to be interacting with the experiment. And you can do that either as a, um, a bot, look, say 10 bots in a row acting on the experiment, or you can have a mixture of people and bots, or you could have all people and, and one bot. But what it lets you do is it lets you very definitely control the strategy of a subset of your users. So if you were trying to model if, for example, people are, can be influenced in your experiment by the way others are uh, acting, you can use bots to do this because it's quite difficult to get some of your users to coordinate, but if you have bots, then they can coordinate really easily because it's just software, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they're defined in the experiment PY, they inherit the, the bot base class, uh, and you can choose to, to run uh, only using bots by using the rec recruiter equals bot, just like we did recruiter equals hot air when we did uh, a sandbox run to, to run in locally. Um, or you can run Dallinger bot and give it a, an app reference to a mm. running app or locally just to spawn one. Mm. And it will use whichever bot is defined for that experiment. Um, there's, there's two implementations of bots. We started off with what we call the standard bots, which use the Selenium Web Driver API, which is originally a testing API. And the idea there is it allows you to delegate all the JavaScript stuff to a browser because you don't want to have to re-implement all your experiment logic in Python for your bot to understand it. So all the bot does is it communicates with the browser running on your machine and accesses the experiment in exactly the same way as a given participant. So for example, this is the bot for the Bartlett demo. The first thing it does is it waits for finished reading to be clickable. Uh, and once that's done, it finds, so it waits for it to be clickable, it doesn't click it. Once it's clickable, it knows that the story is visible. So it finds the stimulus, finds the story within the stimulus and stores the, the text of that story in a variable. And then it clicks ready. And then it waits for the su submit response and reproduction elements to be clickable, which means that it's, the experiment is ready for you to type in your story. It clears the text area of anything that might be in there. It calls transform text on the text that it has stored, which is where it, this bot is modeling its imperfect memory of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, the way it does it is actually just prepends a bit of information as an example. Mm -hmm. And then it submits that, click submit, and returns true. And this participate method is how you define what should happen on the experiment page. There are a bunch of other plugins that you can define to control how it goes through the consent pages or how it interacts with the ad. But generally speaking, if you're following the way that Dangja usually does things, you don't need to change those because it's going to be a pretty standard way of doing it. So it's a relatively small amount of work to allow you to have a, a scripted participant. Hey, hey, one question. So this web drive weight is a Selenium. Where is the... Where is the library that does that? Uh, it, it, it's an import. I can't remember what it is, but it, okay. It, it's... Okay, so for, for us, this is the only... Com like, these are basically the only component that we care about because we can click on stuff. Mm -hmm. And the Selenium Web Driver API is really well documented. Okay, so uh, that's, that's Selenium. There's yeah. some import, but it's basically Selenium, Selenium standard. Yeah. yeah, and you can... This is actually one of the easier things to 
to work on and debug in, in Dallinger because it opens up a browser and you can just like step through the commands one by one and look at the dev tools in the browser and say, oh, okay, like, this is why it didn't work. This thing hasn't loaded yet or mm -hmm. uh, I got this ID wrong. Um, so this is the standard box. So that opens, opens it not headless? Um, this is actually opening it I, head? I do not remember what the default is. But you can change? Yeah, you can. there's a, a config variable where you can choose between Chrome or Firefox as the preference. You can also point it directly at a Selenium server. So one thing uh -huh. I have done is I've run it on my mobile phone. So the, the Dallinger bot opened up a browser on my phone and, and ran it because hmm. We had a specific experiment that um, was optimized for phones and just it seemed a bit easier and I wanted to see if it worked. Um, so, yeah, so, so it can, so if, if you usually, the, the way I usually work with this is headless. Mm -hmm. So this means that if I put the, 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 the default as Chrome, it will open it in the Chrome and I can see what the bot is doing. Um, uh, or it, it doesn't mean if this is the default, doesn't matter, but like it's an option, either that or headless? Uh, you can, I believe they are orthogonal options. You can choose Chrome headless, Firefox headless, Chrome visible, Firefox visible. Uh, I'll have a quick but in theory, see. you can choose both to a certain extent. Yes, you, you can. Uh, uh, yeah, the, That's yeah. Um, <coughs> so, yeah, th those are the standard bots. So, I assume clients are, I mean, workers are as well to put on this in their end. So, if I am a developer or a researcher and I publish the code, if I am doing my tests for success, etc., with bots, which I don't know if you recommend that. Uh, we, we do not recommend that, but yeah. Should I be careful in publishing uh, the code for those bots? If you're running an experiment and someone finds your experimental code, downloads the bot, installs Dallinger, finds your hit, <laughs> and runs it. Run yeah, you do. It, it, it's, it, I mean, you, you could extract this code into a standalone piece of software, but the easiest way would be just to install Dallinger and run it. There is such a high barrier to entry to this that if it, it ever happens to you, it means that you have really pissed off someone in your lab and they're trying to mess with yeah, you. Right. Or, <laughs> or you have a good, that could be a good method for recruiting people to work on that. Yeah. <laughs> That's what exactly I said. Like, if somebody can do it. It's like really high. If you need to ask, would you like to continue? It seems that we don't have started in the browser. Yeah. So, so the code itself, you, you could extract all of it and run it directly with the browser, or you could read it to understand the best way of doing it. But there's no guarantee that what your bot is programmed to do is something that you are incentivizing in your bonus, because you might be actually trying to say, are people going to disagree with the bots? In which case, following this would get you the lowest possible reward. Um, yeah. Dungeon becomes very popular. We are basically talking about people <laughs> copy pasting templates and maybe minor, modific minor modifications to existing projects. So, in that scenario, I think that would be a concern. But maybe that's a yeah, I would love it for that to be a concern, yeah. because if that's a concern, then Dallinger is doing very, very well, and lots of people are really interested in this. <laughs> for me. I doubt it's going to be worth someone putting in the effort to steal your bot when there's a lot of other tasks on MTurk that they could just go after. Um, there's the high-performance bots as well, uh, which makes them sound better, but they're not. <laughs> the high-performance bots have less uh, overhead. They don't use a browser at all, which is really helpful for if you need a load of bots because browsers take up a lot of resources. It might be a half a gigabyte of RAM to run a, a standalone Chrome instance. If you want to run 100 bots, you're going to need 50 gig of RAM on your computer and enough CPU strength. There are services where you can request to host Selenium for you, but those are all aimed at people doing 
testing, testing yeah. not people who want effectively what we want, which is uh, a Selenium instance for 20 minutes, but we want a thousand of them. But there are no services that offer that. Mm. So if you need a lot of bots, you sometimes have to go for the high performance bot space class. They don't use a browser, they interact directly with the experiment, but that does mean that you lose all of this benefit of having the JavaScript executed for you and following your experiment. So you have to interact with it either through manual HTTP calls to the API or through calling bits of the Python API directly. Uh, it makes it a, a lot harder, but it makes some of the really difficult things possible. So I generally would not recommend writing a high performance bot unless you really need one because it's easier to do the small things in the standard ones. So the, the, I just understand, the bots will run locally on your computer? That's the idea? It depends. Um, if you are running on Heroku and you run with either the bots recruiter or one of the recruiters that is a mixture of bots and MTurk, then they will run on Heroku. And we have a build pack that makes sure that there is a browser available so that it can actually do that. And it means you can scale because you can say, actually, I want a lot, like 20 workers who are all performance five servers to make it easier to run all those bots. But you do hit bottlenecks still because Heroku isn't really optimized for running browsers. It, it, it's not something that most people do. Um, so, so if I want to run a mixture of bots and expansion, I think the use case is a lot of people in a, in a given experiment. Then, what is the? How do I control the recruitment of the bots? Separate, like, how? Do, where is that? Where is that hook? I don't think we have that in core, but at least we two. Do we have? Is that in core? Yeah. Okay. So there's a mixed recruiter, and effectively, what that does is it allows you to specify how many people you want from different known recruiters. So you can say, I want a mixed recruiter with 10 people from MTurk and 10 people from the bots recruiter. And it doesn't do anything special about getting the bots first or the bots last. You, you could extend it to do that, but. Mm -hmm. It would be nice if in the slides we have just the, the link there, like the hook. Right. Because like, obviously it's going to require some research from the people who are very interested. But. Yeah. Uh, and one of the, th the tricks that we, we learned with writing bots and high performance bots is um, if you abstract some of the things in your experiment out into utility functions, uh, such as uh, like def get story, def set story, um, you can then write an implementation for the standard bots. And when you, if you ever then needed to switch to a high performance bot, you would have very known places that you have to interact with to, to rewrite them to model the interaction without having to rewrite all of your logic because it's all kind of bundled in together. Mm -hmm. um, so Grid Universe has got some examples of like five or six different types of bots and picking between them and sharing code. So, yeah. Yesterday, uh, well, before yesterday, Discussion was related with this two best uh, question I asked. So it's what you were saying, agent. Mm -hmm. So my question would be: if the if the if the backend is the ground truth, if, if you have everything available there, there, why would you go through all of this trouble if you are not uh, interested in testing in the browser? Why, why wouldn't you just you know go straight uh, to the backend, define a, a smart source uh, you know, that takes care of all of that? Too? Because it limits your problem space. It mean it limits your problem space. It gives you a, a, a entry point where uh, this function is only responsible for participating with one participant. It doesn't have to worry about the idea that uh, it is part of a big experiment and coordinates running ten different instances of it. So using a bot limits your problem space because you can focus just on what it's like as a participant. You're writing it from the perspective of a single user interacting with the experiment. And Dallinger handles the scaling for you. You can, of course, write an arbitrary like backend worker or arbitrary sources that do this kind of thing if that's a better fit for your experiment. If it's a core part of your experiment, I would definitely recommend that. But if you have 
an experiment that works equally well with humans or bots and you want to try with a mixture or some other things, then this is a good one. I had a question about that that sort of thing. So for example, you keep using the example of social pressure, right? I'm mm -hmm. imagining like a like a Solomon Ash uh, what's it called? Obedient. Conformity study. Is it Solomon Ash that did that? Yeah. Um, is is that the one with the the, the uh, people in white coats and prisons and those kind of things? Where... No, this no, is like the one. It's with like a line. Like you've got like five lines in front of you of different lengths. Oh yeah, that one. Yeah. And okay. one of them is clearly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. yeah. Why why should I use bots for that rather than just changing the stimulus that people see? Like, why do I need to have the overhead of writing a bot class rather than saying? Four of your compatriots said this foolish thing. Yeah, I think it's a, think it's a question of level of abstraction, which mm -hmm. is um, like there you're, you're abstracting away the concept of a confederate to just the information that a confederate conveys. And right. if you want to do that, that's, that's fine. If, if, you're, if the thing you're studying is not like describable as like, it, 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 if uh, the confederate's behavior doesn't ground out in line length, but is some more complex behavior, for example, like a specific strategy for um, like resource seeking in a spatial environment. Oh, I see. If... And that depends entirely both on like on like timing and responding in real time to other people's behavior. I see. Like you may actually want to include something like reaction time as mm -hmm. part of the model of the like adversary or of the, of the competitor. In which case, like describing that as like infos or like transmissions isn't that clear whereas like programming mm -hmm. up like a, mm -hmm. a bot that like it's up down left right observes the state of the mm -hmm. game or whatever is and, might be more natural to do. and because bots interact with the actual experiment mm -hmm. they interact in a way that is sort of transparently the same as users so if you are using a web socket they will use the web socket and you don't have to then program in oh i also need to connect to this mm -hmm. and if you are generating infos as jordan says about reaction time that are sort of implicit to how they're behaving all that is handled for you mm -hmm. um, another reason you might want to write a bot is if you have got a experiment that you've run on people and you think you have an idea of what people are doing and you want you write a bot to model your expectation you can then use bots to with the same experiment create a data set of a known strategy so you can compare uh, actual experiment runs with an experiment run of participants only using a known strategy mm -hmm. so you can see the um, how close to the optimum are they or how much worse is it when people aren't cooperating um, these kind of things. Um, yeah, there's, that's about it for bots, really. There's, there's a lot of example stuff in Grid Universe, which is horrifically complex in terms of bots because it's a really complex experiment and they model a lot of things. But um, yeah, bots are there if it happens to fit your requirements. You might consider using them. I think this one's me as well, and it's a bit of a can of worms. <laughs> uh, we kind of we spoke about this a lot on the first day, right? And on yesterday a bit as well, and a bit more earlier today, because it's a really important topic. Um, people are going to try to mess with you, and the amount that they try to mess with you is probably going to be relatively small because the, the cost-benefit is not a huge payout. Um, but you need to be aware of it. So we have these data and attention check functions built into Dallinger, which give you a way of discarding information that you think is bogus because it's just someone randomly clicking or a bot randomly clicking. Um, there's also things that really malicious users could do that you need to be aware of. Like they could open the JavaScript console and start making API calls, or they could I don't know, try a denial of service attack against your backend, put loads of data in that you don't want. Um, it's all pretty unlikely to happen because there's not much benefit to users, uh, but you do need to be aware that it's possible. And if it's something that is likely to happen to you, then 
talk to us and we can start working on ways we can make this better and more secure but right now it, it's it's kind of been a relatively low priority because in, of this cost uh, benefit analysis for malicious users. Um, there's also a few things that you need to be aware of. Um, we spoke briefly about how config variables have a sensitive setting and then Danger will make sure not to give those config variables to users, but there are a few places where you should be careful not to shoot yourself in the foot. Uh, we mentioned briefly about not putting information in an info unless you're sure it's not private ident personally identifiable information, but also there's this public properties feature of experiments, which did we speak about this already? I can't remember. Okay. So if you put something in public properties, then people will be able to see it. They probably won't look for it, but it's possible that they will. And so you should never put anything in there that is going to compromise the security of your experiment. Like never put an API key in, in the public properties, for example. Um, and yeah, don't put private information in an info because someone could theoretically find it. But also, if you're putting your private information in an info, then it's going to be part of your data set. And you don't really want PII to be part of your data set unless you've done a lot of work to make sure that that's something that's acceptable. Um, it's all kind of common sense, really. Um, these are experiments online. And a good portion of us are living in Europe, where we've got these uh, uh, ever-refined privacy laws. Um, just because it's a psychology experiment doesn't mean that the normal rules for running a website don't apply. We've got GDPR. There's also uh, the, the privacy regulations, which make an extra layer on top of this. Um, the most important thing to do is talk to your institution and the people responsible for ethics and privacy in, in your lab and make sure that you're not making a mistake. There's a lot of things that Dallinger lets you do, but it still assumes that you are responsible for the privacy and security of your users. So don't forget about that just because it, you realize, oh, it's easy to do this really fun thing in Dallinger. Um, and yeah, the, you, you can ask us for help, but we're not lawyers. We can't give you legal advice. Um, we will generally err on the side of encouraging you to protect users' privacy quite a lot. Um, but you do need to get outside help with this unless you are an expert yourself.